Hi class. In this video, I want to review some basic facts about complex algebra and complex arithmetic. Um, just to remind you, complex numbers generalize what we mean by real numbers. For any real number x, which is a, an element of the reals, we can generalize it to an element z, which is x plus i y, where x and y are real numbers and i is the square root of minus 1. Such a complex number z is an element of the complex numbers we use the symbol capital C to represent the complex numbers. We can geometrically interpret these complex numbers. We talked about this a little bit when we were talking about Euler's formula. Uh, any complex number can be represented by a point in the plane. So just like we talk about the real numbers being on the real line, we talk about the complex numbers being in the complex plane. We usually use z to represent that. x is the real part of the complex number, and y is the imaginary part. And just like we talked about in Euler's formula, if we look at the polar representation of that same two-dimensional coordinate x and y, there's a radius and an angle. And the, the complex number z can be written as r e to the i theta using Euler's formula. Again, we need to be a little careful, and here we'll see why, that um, about our definition of the angle theta, because we know the arctangent is actually multi-valued. For any given value y over x, there are many different angles theta that we could associate with that. In particular, if we think about this in the complex plane, that corresponds to the fact that we can define the range of the angle theta that we use in this complex representation of z. We could choose theta to be between 0 and 2 pi. One way of representing that is to introduce something called the cut plane. That is, instead of this being just a, a plane like a sheet of paper, we can think about it, a big scissors coming in from infinity and cutting just below the real axis, the real positive axis. And that way, the only way we can define theta is to go from the real axis up. So it goes from 0 to 2 pi going around like this, but we can't go any further. Another way of defining this angle is to choose the angle to run between minus pi and pi. That corresponds to the cut. Again, think about a big scissors coming in from infinity and uh, cutting a sheet of paper along the negative real axis to the origin. Then it's separated here. And then theta naturally runs from, uh, mi uh, from pi on this side to minus pi. And some, one way or another, we're going to have to choose by convention what range of theta we're going to uh, talk about. And that's going to have an impact uh, when we, on the next slide. Now, for any given complex number z, we can define the complex conjugate, z star or z bar, as basically you take the imaginary part and change the sign, so it's x minus i y. By looking at this definition, you see it's just r e to the minus i theta. In this representation, r e to the i theta, by the way, the uncertainty in what we mean by theta by 2 pi doesn't matter, for if we change theta by 2 pi, either addition or subtraction, we talk about the same value of z. Z, z star or z, z bar is just the value r squared, which is just x squared plus y squared, the sum of the real and imaginary part squared. And that's known as the norm of the complex number squared, just like the norm of a vector. Let's talk about a few examples of using the polar representation. So i, the square root of minus 1, is just e to the i pi over 2. We can verify that by expanding it out as cosine pi over 2 plus i sine pi over 2. But this angle pi over 2, as we talked about, we could equally well call it pi over 2 plus 2 pi or pi over 2 minus 2 pi, etc. So there are an infinite number of different theta we could put in here, but they all correspond to the same uh, value i, the same complex number. Similarly, minus 1 is e to the i pi. Sometimes people call this the most beautiful formula uh, in mathematics. Often it's written e to the i pi plus 1 equals 0. And it's easy to verify using Euler's formula. But again, we could have chosen pi or 3 pi or 5 pi or minus pi or minus 3 pi or minus 5 pi. They'd all give the same representation of minus 1. Now, that doesn't matter when we're just talking about the complex number itself. But if we think about taking the complex number to a fractional power, like taking the square root, taking it to the 1 half power, then the angle that we use actually matters. So if we think about i to the 1 half, if I use this representation, e to the i pi over 2, I get e to the i pi over 2 to the 1 half. And remember our rule, when we exponentiate something, we just multiply the exponent. So this is e to the i pi over 4. And we can work this out. It's 1 plus i over the square root of 2. It's worth just doing a little algebra to show that 1 plus i over 2 squared actually gives you uh, gives you i when you square it. 
but instead of pi over 2, I could have chosen two, pi over 2 plus 2 pi. If I do that and I take the square root, I get easy i of 5 pi over 4, which is not the same as this. In fact, it's minus 1 plus i over the square root of 2. So you, we see that the ambiguity in the angle, the ambiguity in, in the argument, if you want, of the complex number, is just the same as the, it gives us exactly the number of square roots we know we need to have. We know that if we take 25, for example, and take the square root, it could be either plus 5 or minus 5. Both of those numbers square to be 25. There are two square roots. This is sometimes referred to as talking about two branches of the square root, and we'll talk a little bit about that on the next slide when we talk about the logarithm. Similarly, if we talk about the third root, that's, some, that's like taking the third root of some number, r, e, v, i, theta. It doesn't matter what what theta is or what r is. Again, r is the, is the modulus and theta is the argument of the complex number z. We took the third root, we get r to the one-third e to the i theta over three. We need to choose some convention for theta. So, for example, let's take zero theta between zero and two pi. But if I do that, in the argument, I could have I could have used theta, whatever this theta was, I could have used theta plus two pi. That shifts the cube root by e to the i two pi over three. Or I could have chosen e to the four pi, uh, theta plus four pi. That shifts the cube root by e to the i four pi over three. This corresponds to the three third roots that we know that uh, a number can have. If we take a cube root, we should have three different possibilities. And these are what the three different possibilities are that correspond to taking three different choices for the argument. What if I did one more? If I did theta plus 6 pi, it would shift by e to the i 6 pi over 3. Ah, but e to the i 6 pi over 3 is e to the 2 pi i, which is known to its friends as 1. So this pattern will give us three different roots, and then it'll start repeating again and again. And this shows us that the, the third root of a complex number um, ha has actually three branches, if we think about this function. Well, if two branches are good, then an infinite number of branches is better. And we can actually look at a function that has an infinite number of branches, an infinite number of these ambiguities, and what we mean by the value. Take the logarithm of z. If we use the polar representation, the logarithm is fairly easy to compute. The log of r e to the i theta, well, the logarithm of the product is the sum of the logarithm. So we get the logarithm of r. That's unambiguous, plus i theta. But now, theta matters. If we had e to the i theta, shifting theta by 2 pi doesn't matter at all. But when theta appears explicitly, as it does in the logarithm, then we have to define very carefully what branch of the logarithm, how we're going to define the theta associated with the logarithm. And so in fact, in this case, there are an infinite number of possibilities. We could take theta, theta if, if we choose by convention, theta to run between 0 and 2 pi. Or you could take theta plus 2 pi, theta plus 4 pi, theta plus 6 pi theta minus 2 pi, theta minus 4 pi, minus, theta minus 6 pi. And all of these are legitimate logarithms of the same complex number. The log function has an infinite number of branches. So this means when we actually run into the logarithm in uh, a physical problem, and we, for whatever reason, are interested in thinking about analytically continuing it to the complex plane, we have to think carefully about how theta is defined implicitly. Normally, it's defined because we're usually taking the logarithm of some physical quantity that's a real, real number, and therefore theta is 0. And therefore, we want a definition of theta, which is continuous as theta varies from 0. So usually, in physics, we'll be taking the branch of theta where theta runs from minus pi to pi. Then theta doesn't change discontinuously along the real axis of theta equals 0. In mathematics, it's usually conventional to take theta to run between 0 and 2 pi. Again, that's like taking a big scissors and coming in from infinity just below the real axis. So by definition, you can't cross it. You just can't. So theta goes from 0 to 2 pi and, no, uh, and nowhere else. The problem with this definition is it's not continuous light along, along the real axis. If we go above or we go below, we get two very different answers because we have to cross this branch cut. And normally, that's not useful to us in physics.